Greetings, Tiffany. Greetings, greetings. Happy Thursday, everybody. It is November the 11th, 2021. Today, y'all, we are on day 300. Day 300 of year three of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets and of the three-year consecutive day count. Day 968. Today, y'all, we're reading Psalms 91 through 94. Then we're going to pick up what we left off at in chapter 7. Um, and Shakespeare's Secret Messiah with Romeo and Juliet. 96. All right, y'all. Go ahead and do the shimmer. Tiffany. I don't know that I'm giving this one up. Because I, 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 I like the, the, the wraps that are colorful colors everywhere Levine, blessings blessings where did i get it from you know what i i think i ordered from amazon i think i gotta look i ordered a lot of my different wraps through amazon different vendors on amazon i'm gonna have to look for it i gotta look at my previous orders and see if i see this if not i picked it up when we were somewhere because like, I'm always looking for scarves for head wraps and stuff. So, um, I'll check. Because they had different colors. I know they were, like, you don't even really see the colors for real until you open it up. Like, there, I love it. The tassels, even they. <laughs> yes, I love the colors, right? It's just, I love them. I love them so much. <laughs> I'm gonna have, I'm gonna look it up and I'll send it to you. Hopefully, I, this is one of the ones from one of the vendors off Amazon, and you can just go there and um and look at the different ones. Trina, hey girl, hey. Is soy not good for you? Uh, I try to stay away from soy because at one point, <laughs> when soy first came out, or uh. They haven't always looked at soy as something for consumption by humans, right? Um, so when I found that out, I'm like, well, what has changed? <laughs> and so when I found that out a few years ago, I tried, I mean, I, I really stopped consuming soy. So, yeah, I would say look into it so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You can probably just Google it, too. And, um... I went in, because Googling, you, you have to qualify your information with Google, too. It's good in some places, but, um, like, Google will help you find some people. Matter of fact, if you listen to Yaki, type in Yaki and soy-based products or something like that, and you should be able to find one of his videos where he actually talked about it. I remember him saying something a couple times about it. Um... But it was actually before I even heard of Yaki that I found out about soy. And I, 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 stopped, I stopped messing around with soy Tylene years ago. You know, so. But look into it. I, I don't. Pea protein is the hidden name of soy. The Really? Didn't know that. Didn't look that much into it. I just always look for soy. Um, but yeah, check it, check it out, Tylene. Thanks, Dana. Thanks. So, all right, beautiful people. Let's go ahead and get this Shema done. We won't be here tomorrow. This is the Sabbath. A lot of plant-based are moving to that. Beyond Meat uses it. Yeah. I will look into it. I, I really try to stay away from... Um, Although it's good and I will eat it from time to time, like the Beyond Meats. I actually think the Beyond Meats are better than the Impossible Meat. I really do. Um, but I try to stay away from it. I, I try to keep my diet like whole foods, plant-based for the most part. Like, if I don't sit there and watch you make my burger plant-based... I don't really know what you're putting in it for real. 
right? You know, so I I much rather make my own stuff, you know. So I'm, I'm, that's just me. Because soy is bad. They changed the name, but still soy. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So you got to be careful. Yeah, Thailand, I would say just, just look into it. Because I know... Um, I know you you transition into like plant based and everything. You've asked me a lot of questions about it, you know, offline too. Okay, all right, y'all. So let me find the shimmer. Okay, there we go. All right, y'all. The shimmer is found in Deuteronomy chapter six, starting at verse three. Here, therefore, O Israel, excuse me. Yeah, same girl. <laughs> oh my goodness, I be talking so much to my sister, I just be like, girl, look. So, <sighs> I digress. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily as Yahuwah, the mighty one of our fathers, has promised us in a land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our mighty one, he is one, and you shall love you who are your mighty one with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Yahuwah, our mighty one, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahuwah, our mighty one, as he has commanded us. I got you, Talay. I know it's sometimes it's hard. The transition is hard. I mean, unless you um have something really bad going wrong with you. Like when I first went, I was so sick. Um, I was like, shucks, Josh is Josh is eleven now. A little over eleven years ago, I was so sick. Um, like my it was like the morning sickness. It was so bad, like. Like, I was down most of my pregnancy. I probably had the worst morning sickness with him. Um, but that's also, I say, when I got about six or seven months, that's when, um, yeah, like, I was like six or seven months. Probably more like seven months. That's when my uncle, he had come across this product called Nature's Pearl. Boy, I tell you. The, the muscadine, the muscadine grape does wonders for the body. And, yo, when I say, y'all, when I say it cleared up my morning sickness, it cleaned up my morning sickness. Like, when I started taking it, and, like, I could I could feel, like, results. I ain't going to say almost immediately, but I say within the hour, I could feel the easing of it. And it's the muscadine grape seed. The um, company is called Nature's Pearl. I don't know. I think they're still around. I, I just haven't really looked into them for the last couple of years. I actually became a representative for it because um, it was so good, you know, and a, a lot of people purchased it from me. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, it, it does. It does one. And you'll hear, you'll hear Yaki if you listen to him a lot. You'll hear him talking about grape seeds and stuff like that. But it really does. It doesn't just help with morning sickness. It'll restore a lot of different things in your body. Um, matter of fact, he, act he actually um, recommends it to those who've actually gone through chemotherapy um, with different things. Just because of what it does for the body. And it helps to push out toxins from the body and the bloodstream and everything. Um, but he, he did a real in-depth video about grape seeds and how it cleanses the body. I gotta find it. Um yeah I would have I would have to look for it. Yahuwah is one shalom shalom thank you. Um but yeah like I said unless you unless you got Talane unless something like really bad going wrong with you um a lot of people don't go like plant based or vegan like cold turkey. Shayla hey yeah hey but I did 
back then because I was so sick and um which probably helped a lot as well too I stopped eating meat and dairy like cold turkey from everything and what began to happen was my body began to correct itself the the female issues that I had going on like the morning sickness and the doctors already telling me they um and I get told y'all that story before about me having um gestational diabetes but the doctors was telling me they was like Miss Murphy your sugar so high you probably had diabetes <laughs> we just caught it here because you know we had to do the test and they consider it gestational diabetes but they say it's so high that you probably already had diabetes before you got pregnant and listen to them talk i was thinking to myself i said that could be true thinking about my diet and how i eat and stuff and all the processed foods and stuff and i've always had a sweet tooth but it's really like the processed foods and junk foods that really drive your sugar up because of the way it breaks down in the body right it's the bad type of sugars that break down that drive that sugar up and it doesn't just come from sweet stuff it come from starches and things like that um kids complain every day dana my kids are not 100 percent vegan right they they are i would say for the most part they are for the most part they are like because their dad my husband is still transition as well but um he likes more fish now even like with the chicken he said he about tired of the chicken too you know so um he's doing more like seafood and everything you know which how some people trans they come off like the red meats and go to the lighter meats and you know then sometimes just the fish and you know so there's progress but yeah the, yeah so i don't i don't beat them up about it dana um because if they want some, especially if I didn't make some for their dad, if they see their dad eating it, they'll just come grab a piece. And sometimes I'm like, no. I mean, I don't say it, but I'm just like, this is defeating the purpose <laughs> of transitioning them. But I don't want to push it on them, you know, because they're not, it ain't like, you know. But I do make sure there's a variety of the other plant-based things. But, you know, you got to cook kids. They, they picky, find something they like, at least with my kids, and I just keep cooking it right but my kids love collard greens because i do a mean collard greens <laughs> and i was shocked they love collard greens they love cabbage you know just the way i cook and season my stuff um because if i gotta eat it it need to taste good don't come pushing me no bland food right you know um but you just gotta um i don't know this is it's a process with the kids it's if they've already been introduced to me, right? But I noticed now Josh, my 11-year-old, the one that I went vegan with, Josh is probably the most plant-based next to me and Jeremiah out of the rest of the children. Um, Josh will rarely eat meat. Even when I cook, he's like, mm, no, man, he'll just get the sides. Or Josh will even make him salads. That's just, it's kind of in him. And even when I had him, I like juice his juices. I literally made his baby food. They, I didn't give my children the last four in a way. I didn't give them store bought uh, baby food. I made their food. Like even like potatoes. Sometimes people do potatoes. I ain't did box potatoes, and I don't know how long. You know, I just I like to cook everything fresh. But it's easier for them to live a plant based like if they if from birth. That's how they've been. You know, that's how they've been reared you know um the other ones it, it they eat it but like i said they're not big on it for real like they ain't they you know i don't know it's just dana that's just just i don't know that's just my household so but then like i said they're not 100 josh, like i said josh is probably the closest to vegan you know next to us because he you know y'all get it right so, but yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Tyler and she said, well, me too with all my babies. I had severe morning sickness in the first one. I lost 20 pounds in the first three months. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Y'all, let's start the reading. Because I can talk about this all day. Because I find myself about to tell, share another story with y'all. But that's going to lead into this next story that links to that. And before I know it, it will be at 50 minutes. All right, so let me pull this up. Um, but yeah, Tyler, look into that. Look into that. You'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about when you pull up, you know, the soy and everything. 
Okay, y'all. One of my most favorite songs. Psalm 91. I mean, we were young. We memorized this song. Me and my sister, we were, and I think I told y'all this before, we would lay in bed at night, and she would say half, and I would say the ending half, and the next night, I would do the first half, and she would do the ending half. All right, y'all. Psalm 91. And this, we know Psalm 91 as a, a psalm of protection. Auntie, Belinda Brown, shalom. Matter of fact, let me just... We recite it, I know it, in the King James Version. I'm about to switch to the King James Version to read it, but I'm going to leave it here. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about Yahuwah, that he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust in him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors by night, nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make you who are your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Yahuwah says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. I love it. Psalm 92, a song, a song to be sung on the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to Yahuwah to sing praises to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning, your faithfulness in the evening, accompanied by a ten-string instrument, a harp, and a melody of a lyre. You thrill me, Yah, with all you have done for me. I sing for joy because of what you have done. Oh, Yah, what great works you do. And how deep are your thoughts. Only a simpleton would not know, and only a fool would not understand this. Though the wicked sprout like weeds and evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, O oh Yah, will be exalted forever. Your enemies, Yah, will surely perish. All evildoers will be scattered. But you have made me as strong as a wild ox. You have anointed me with the finest oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the defeat of my wicked opponents. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. But they are transplanted to Yahuwah's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. They will declare, Yahuwah is just. He is my rock. There is no evil in him. Psalm 93, Yahuwah is king. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, Yahuwah is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Yah, has stood from time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Yah. The floods have roared like thunder, but the floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, and Yahuwah above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, O Yah, is holy forever and ever. Last chapter. Psalm 94, Josiah, Shalom. Jo I mean Josiah. My baby is named Josiah. <laughs> and I'm, every time I see it, I'm used to saying Ja. Like, I actually have to 
correct people sometimes when they even you can read his name they say Joe no it's Ja like Ja Ya Josiah last chapter for today Psalm chapter 94 O oh, Yah, the God of vengeance, O oh, God of vengeance, let your glorious justice shine forth. Arise, O oh, judge of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. How long, O oh, Yah, how long will the wicked be allowed to gloat? How long will they speak with arrogance? How long will these evil people boast? They crush your people, Yah, hurting those you claim as your own. They kill widows and foreigners and murder orphans. Yahuwah isn't looking, they say. And besides, the God of Israel doesn't care. Think again, you fools. When will you finally catch on? Is he deaf, the one who made your ears? Is he blind, the one who formed your eyes? He punishes the nations. Won't he also punish you? He knows everything. Doesn't he also know what you are doing? Yahuwah knows people's thoughts. He knows they are worthless. Joyful are those you discipline, Yah, those you teach with your instructions. You give them relief from troubled times until a pit is dug to capture the wicked. Yahuwah will not reject his people. He will not abandon his special possession. Judgment will again be founded on justice, and those with virtuous hearts will pursue it. Who will protect me from the wicked? Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Unless Yahuwah had helped me, I would soon have settled in the silence of the grave. I cried out, I am slipping. But your unfailing love, O Yah, supported me. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. Can unjust leaders claim that God is on their side? Leaders whose decrees permit injustice? They gang up against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But Yahuwah is my fortress. My God is mighty. My God is the mighty rock where I hide. Yahuwah will turn the sins of evil people back on them. He will destroy them for their sins. Yahuwah, our God, will destroy them. All right, beautiful people. That is our reading for today. That was Psalm 91 through 94. Let's pull up this book. We get back to Romeo and Juliet. All right, y'all. So I said yesterday I was going to go back and reread this last um, paragraph that we had read. Because it's about to go into this back and forth between Peter and the musician. And um, and we are actually, where we at? We have 22 minutes. Let me read. If I keep reading, we'll make it to the end of the chapter. All right. Okay, let's do this. Scholars have previously noticed Romeo and Juliet's numerous citations of New Testament passages related to the Apostle Peter and also the speeches of the Peter who was a servant to the Capulets. These allusions begin with a quote from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, suggesting that women are weaker vessels. Act 1, scene 1, line 15. Next is a passage in which Peter rashly draws his sword. Act 2, scene 4, line 154 through line 157 bring into mind the event in the garden of Gethsemane where Peter drew his sword to cut off a priest's servant's ear. You can find that in John chapter 18, verse 10. Mr. Goodwill tells the men to put away their swords since they, quote, know not what you do, end quote. That's Act 1, Scene 1, line 65. Blending Jesus' instruction to Peter, to put his sword away, John 18, 11, with his words from the cross, for, quote, forgive them for they know not what they do, end quote, Luke 23, 34. Finally, the wedding of Paris and Juliet was to be celebrated at St. Peter's Church. In my view, these St. Peter references are included in the play simply to help the reader understand that it is a reworking of Gospel's story concerning Passover and the Christ's passion in which Peter played a central role. Knowing that the character Peter is related to the Apostle Peter 
explains the mysterious and irreverent exchange between Peter and a group of musicians, Act 4, Scene 5, Line 100 through 140. Following Juliet's feigned death, Peter asks the musicians to play some merry dump, an oxymoron meaning a song that is both merry and sad. The musicians ask what reward they will be given. Peter refuses to give them money and offers them a minstrel or a vagabond instead. But the musicians say that they only play for silver. The passage is notable in that Emilio Bassano came from a family of Jewish musicians or recorders who would have also known the truth of the gospel's satire and may represent actual witticisms exchanged between Emilia and her musician cousins and uncles while they played at Christian events. Their comedy is black. The dump is a sad song is now merry because the death of a Gentile it commemorates is a merry event to this particular group of recorders. They are paid in silver because the scene takes place just before the Last Supper, and that was the currency paid to Judas at the same point in the version of the story given in the Gospels. Peter says, on my faith, that he will give the musicians the gleek, G-L-E-E-K, meaning jest or riddle in exchange for their playing. The musicians respond, saying that if Peter gives them the solution, that they will give him the serving creature. In other words, the joke is that the Christ was the serving creature. That is, he was cannibalized. Being crypto-Jews, the recorders have false names. All Jews had to adopt Christian names in England during the period. They decided to avoid dinner, unlike the unknowing Gentiles who are about to participate in an unsavory feast. Note that the song Peter describes relates to the end of the play and that the destruction of the Gentile nobility is the red dress, oh, I'm sorry, not red dress, the redress for the execution of the Jews Messiah. Quote, and so now Peter and the musician goes back and forth. Musicians, oh musicians, hearts ease, hearts ease, oh, and you will have me live play hearts ease. First musician, why heart's ease? Peter, oh musicians, because my heart itself plays. My heart is full of woe. Oh, play me some merry dump to comfort me. First musician, not a dump, we. Tis no time to play now. Peter, you will not then? First musician, no. Peter, then I will then give you sound. I'm sorry. I will then give it you soundly. First musician, what will you give us? Peter, no money on my faith but the gleek. I will give you the minstrel. First musician, then I will give you the serving creature. Peter, then I will lay the serving creature's dagger on your plate. I will carry no crochets. I'll re you. I'll fa you. Do you note me? <laughs> That's funny. He was playing on the the musical notes. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Yeah. Listen. <laughs> Peter, then will I lay the serving creature's dagger on your plate. I will carry no crochets. I'll re you. I'll fa you. Do you note me? First musician, and you re us and fa us, you note us. Second musician, pray you, put up your dagger and put out your wit. Peter, then have you, then have at you with my wit. I will dry beat you with an iron wit and put up my iron dagger. Answer me like men when gripping grief the heart doth wound and doleful dumps the mind oppress. The music with her silver sound. Why silver sound? Why music with her silver sound? What say you, Simon Catlin? Musician, Mary, sir, because silver hath a sweet sound. Peter, pretty. What say you, Hugh Rebeck? Second musician, I say silver sound because musicians sound for silver. Peter, pretty too. 
What say you, James Soundpost? Third musician, Faith, I know not what to say. Peter, oh, I cry you mercy. You are the singer. I will say for you, it is music with her silver sound, because musicians have no gold for sounding. Then music with her silver sound, with speedy help doth lend redress. And Peter exits the room. First musician, what a pestilent knave is this same. Second musician, hang him, Jack. Come, we'll in here tarry for the mourners and stay dinner. That's at four, scene five, line 148. This scene also sets up a playful type, type, typological sequential parallel to the story, to the passion story in the Gospels. The sequence begins with the nurse's sevenfold repetition of the word woe as she discovers Juliet has apparently died, echoing Jesus' repetitious curse, quote, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, end quote, of Matthew 23. Quote, the nurse, oh, woe, oh, woeful, woeful, woeful day, most lamentable day, most woeful day that ever, ever I did yet behold. Oh, day, oh, day, oh, day, oh, hateful day. Never was seen so black a day as this. Oh, woeful day, oh, woeful day. End quote. Act 4, scene 5, line 55. The narration then moves on to the scene with Peter and the musician, which includes textual elements invoking Jesus' capture, the 30 pieces of silver, trial and beating, and concludes with a statement, Hang him, Jack, describing the crucifixion. Notice how the scene's incoherency fades away once the play is read with the correct interpretive framework. Friar Lawrence's hidden plot to destroy the Gentiles begins when Romeo tells Friar Lawrence that he has fallen in love with Juliet and asks him to preside over their wedding. The friar agrees and foresees the future. Quote, but come, young waverer, come, go with me. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be. For this alliance may so happily prove to turn your household rancer to pure love. End quote. That's Act 2, Scene 3, Line 95. On the surface, this appears to be a blessing, however unlikely the friar's reasoning might be, as it is difficult to believe that the friar expects that such a sweet elopement will be endearing to the youth's parents. But I believe this is also a double entrande. The friar is referring to the pile of dead Gentiles at the play's end as pure love. In other words, his goal is to orchestrate the eating of the cankerous weeds he described in his previous soliloquy. From this point forward, he causes every action or decision central to the storyline. It must be remembered when evaluating Friar Lawrence's behavior that he believes the Gentile nobility is a false root that will be destroyed by the canker of its own hatred. As the friar commences the wedding of the ill-fated couple, he repeats the ominous request to, quote, come with me. Come, come with me, and we will make short work, end quote. Act 2, scene 6, line 35. In a moment of passion, in a moment of passion, Romeo kills Tybalt and is banished from Verona. Friar Lawrence meets with him and Juliet's nurse. The friar is a com the friar is in complete control of the characters that are coming to him, coming with him. Let me read that again. Hold on. The friar is in complete control of the characters that are coming with him to their destruction. He instructs the nurse to commend me to your lady, Act 3, Scene 3, Line 165, which begins the setup for Juliet's agreement to take a potion that will cause the appearance of death. Friar Lawrence then instructs Romeo, quote, Sojourn in Minuta, I'll find out your man, and he shall signify from time to time every good hap to you that chances here, end quote. 
That's Act 3, Scene 3, Line 169 through Line 172. By telling Romeo that he will find out his man, Balthazar, and have him bring every good, every good hap, which is news, Friar Lawrence sets his plot in motion and leaves a clue for the alert reader whose meaning will become clear later in the play. Once Juliet learns that her parents are going to force her to marry Count Paris, she meets privately with the friar to seek his advice. Father Lawrence tells her that Friar Lawrence tells her that does spy a kind of hope at four scene one line sixty eight and instructs her and and instructs her to take his death simulating potion. He tells her that once she is buried in her family's crypt, she will be revived and Romeo will come and take her to his place of exile. Of course, he could simply tell her to flee with Romeo to Minuta, but that would not create the situation the friar is trying to create. The friar tells Juliet that the drug will make her appear lifeless for exactly 40 and two hours. Act 4, Scene 1, Line 102. The author is creating a symbolic numerical landscape that mirrors the Passover story in the Gospels in which Daniel's prophecies also form the backdrop. In this case, the number 42 is miraculously related to Daniel by his prediction that there would be 1,290 days, that is, 42 months, or three and a half years between the end of the daily sacrifice and the abomination of desolation. And that's in Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 through 12. Scholars have been puzzled by the length of time Juliet is drugged. Though the first three acts have specified, I'm sorry, though the first three acts have specific time references, the overall timeline of the play becomes strangely ambiguous at, at its end. We know that the play begins on Sunday morning, that Romeo and Juliet are married on Monday afternoon, and that plans for Juliet's wedding to Paris are settled on Tuesday evening. However, from that point forward, the play avoids making specific statements about the weekday of each scene's occurrence. I remember this because I just rewatched this the other night. I, I I see this whole scene playing out as I'm reading this. If the events proceed according to Capulet's proclaimed plans, then the wedding guests should be arriving Wednesday morning only to find that a funeral is taking place instead. Balthazar watches Juliet placed in the crypt and then presently brings the news to Romeo. Act 5, scene 1. Verse 21, thus traveling on a swift horse, he would be meeting with Romeo on Wednesday afternoon, which places Romeo at Juliet's grave Wednesday evening. This timeline encompasses three and a half days from its beginning Sunday morning to the bloodbath of Wednesday night in order to comically reverse the Gentiles' use of Daniel in the Gospels. In other words, the play's three and a half day time span links to Daniel's prophecy that the end of the sacrifice would come at the midpoint of the week, Daniel 9.27. However, this timeline seemingly contradicts Friar Lawrence's statement that Juliet would be drugged for 42 hours, as well as the night watchman's statement that Juliet has been in a grave for two days, Act 5, Scene 3, Line 176. To resolve the contradictions, Scholars have suggested that Shakespeare was sloppy and simply forgot to insert an extra day before Balthazar's meeting with Romeo, thereby delaying the discovery of the drug Juliet and all subsequent events until Thursday. In fact, the author wants an alert reader to recognize that Friar Lawrence's prophecy... Hold on. In fact... The author wants an alert reader to recognize that Friar Lawrence's prophecy about the 42 hours as an enigma. To 
to solve Shakespeare's enigma, a reader must first recognize that the borrowed likeness of shrunk death Friar Lawrence referred to was the false religion of the Gentiles, Christianity, which uses the borrowed likeness of the dead Jewish Messiah as its symbol. Quote, and in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death, thou shalt continue forty, I'm sorry, thou shalt continue two and forty hour. Act four, scene one, line 106 through line 107. Friar Lawrence's statement is a double entrande whose subtle meaning comically mirrors the absurd use of Daniel in the Gospels. In other words, his apparent error was a, was a divinely inspired prediction that the sacrifice of the false Christian Messiah would occur at the midpoint of a week, the moment when Romeo would, in Daniel's terms, be cut off. The prophetic burlesque works like clockwork, and Juliet not only wakes up early enough to hear the mandrake scream, but also late enough to bring about the cutting off of the Gentiles' false messiah. Scholars who don't get the joke are forced to conjecture about the timeline in order to make it coherent. But the playwright did not blunder and was simply mocking Josephus's jiggering the course of events in the Jewish war to make it appear that Daniel's prophecies were coming to pass. In Act Four, I'm sorry, in Act Five, Scene Two, Friar Lawrence did not send Balthazar with the crucial message to Romeo, but rather the scatterbrained Friar John who managed to get himself caught up in a quarantine. Meanwhile, by failing to inform Balthazar that Juliet was really still alive, the friar, knowing Balthazar's loyalty to Romeo, ensured that Romeo would be swiftly and wrongly notified of Juliet's death. After Friar Lawrence learns that Friar John had not delivered the letter, he is alone and mentions that he intends to write again to Romeo and Minuta and that he intends to keep Juliet in his cell. Keep Juliet in his cell. Act 5, scene 2, line 28. This begs the question, of course, why he did not do these obvious things instead of faking Juliet's death. The solution to this enigma is revealed by the friar's final prophecy. Quote, poor living course closed closed in a dead man's tomb, end quote. That's Act 5, Scene 2, Line 30. The statement is prophetic in that Juliet will soon be in a tomb with the dead Romeo. It is also a pun as Juliet will be a course in the subsequent meal. The friar can see the future because he is bringing it about. One can see the explanatory power of the interpretation that the play reverses the Flavian's typology in the Gospels. This interpretation resolves all of the play's contradictions and incoherencies. For example, the fatal events of Friar Lawrence orchestrated at the Catholic's tomb occur in a perfect order. The friar himself arrives at the tomb at just the right moment to be able to inform Juliet that Romeo has killed himself because he thought that she was dead. Instead of helping Juliet with her grief, however, Friar Lawrence abandons Juliet because a noise did scare me from the tomb. Act 5, Scene 3, Line 268. The noise that frightened Friar Lawrence, overtly the sound of the night watch arriving, also represents the mandrake root screaming with the death of Romeo. This is the reason why Juliet was afraid that she would hear a mandrake scream if she awoke early. Act 4, scene 3, line 47. Her prophecy was correct, and she awoke as Romeo was dying. His lips were still warm. Act 5, scene 3, line 167. And figuratively, she heard the mandrake scream as it was torn from the earth. All of the seemingly irrelevant details of the play 
come together within the correct interpretation and create a logical subtext. Within the satirical level of Romeo and Juliet, the bread, the Gentile celebrants of the festival of Lammas Tide, ate following the mass slaughter of Gentiles at the tomb, was the same bread that the Jews ate at Passover described in the Gospels, named, namely human flesh. The author builds this subtext by the chronic use of imagery that describes humans as food, for by the tearing off of human joints. The sheer preponderance of this theme is telling, and some of the related passages are given below. At the beginning of the play, someone called Samson is told that he is not fish. This is because someone with the name Samson would be a Jew, and in this play, Jews are not fish. In this satire, the Christians are the fish. Poor John being a simple meal of fish. Quote, Gregory. Tis well thou art not fish, if thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. End quote. Act 1, scene 1, line 30. Mercutio, when he understood that he was about to die, announced that he was peppered. Friar Lawrence tossed Rosemary unto Juliet's lifely, lifeless body before she was placed into the crypt. When Juliet foresaw her death, Romeo replied, Dry sorrow drinks our blood. Act 3. Scene 5, line 58. Juliet's last name, Capulet, is also part of this theme as it is a pun on Capulin, a fish from the North Sea common to English diets, better known as capers. Another example of the theme occurs when, Rome when Romeo enters Juliet's tomb and senses a, quote, feasting presence, quote, Romeo. I'll bury thee in a triumphant grave. A grave? Oh no, a lantern, a lantern, slaughtered youth. For here lies Juliet, and her beauty makes this vault a feasting presence full of light. Death, lie thou there by a dead man interred. End quote. That's Act 5, Scene 3, Line 84. The clearest representation of the coming cannibalism on Lammas Tide occurs in another of Romeo's statements as he enters the tomb. Quote, Romeo, thou detestable man, thou womb of death, gorged with the dearest morsel of the earth, thus I enforce thy rotten jaws to open, and in despite I'll cram thee with more food. End quote. Perhaps the wittiest example if the term can be applied here, of the word play concerning cannibalism is a theme that runs throughout the play regarding joints. The author begins her punning on the word joint in the following passage in which Juliet's father instructs her to take her joints to church and then refers to her as carrion. Quote, Capulet, how now, how now, chop logic. What is this? Proud, and I thank you, and I thank you not, and yet not proud, mistress meaning you. Thank me no thankings, nor proud me no prouds, but fettle your fine joints against Thursday next to go with Paris to St. Peter's Church, or I will drag thee on a hurdle thither. Out, you green sickness carrion, out, you bag, you tallow face. Act 3, scene 5. 149-157. This was her daddy. He was pissed that she didn't want to marry Paris, right? Came into her bedroom. Came in all nice and sweet because she saw her crying or whatever. You know, oh, baby, what's wrong? You know, mama was there. Mama had already knew because her mama came in and told her, look, your daddy didn't hook you up with Paris. He didn't set this wedding up and you supposed to be marrying him 30th at, on Thursday at St. Peter's Church. She was like, what? No, mom, I'm in love with Romeo. He was like, yeah, baby, I know. But your daddy ain't having none of it. He said, Romeo, pretty much, he's a peasant, and you need to marry Paris because he comes from money. She said, I will not, I will not, I will not. I'm in love with Romeo, right? And here come her daddy in because she crying because she just found out she supposed to be marrying Paris when she um, is marrying Romeo. And he was like, oh, darling, what is wrong? And, you know, finally she told him, and daddy went off. And this right here, you got to watch it in action. You actually got to go watch the movie. 
I'm like, she, he pretty much told her, he said, listen here, you ungrateful wench. I just paired you up with the best thing and you, you gonna be wealthy for the rest of your life, not have any kind of sorrows whatsoever. And you telling me you want to marry a peasant, right? Daddy went off. He said, if you don't have your butt down there at St. Peter's Church on Thursday morning, you are no daughter of mine. You will get out of here. He said, I will not claim you ever again, right? I'm like, dang, that was pretty harsh. Like, yes, of shalom. Y'all got to go watch it, I'm telling you. If you ain't watched it in a while, <laughs> you got to go watch it again. The author then builds upon the theme in the following passage in which Juliet envisions playing madly with joints at her family's tomb. Quote, Juliet, so early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad. Oh, if I wake, shall I not be destroyed? Environed with all these hideous fears, and madly play with my forefather's joints and pluck the mangled tip bolt from his shroud. And in this rage, with some great kinsman's bone, as with a club, dash out my desperate brains. Oh, look, methinks I see my cousin's ghost. Speak out, Romeo, that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. End quote. Scene four, act three. I'm sorry. Act 4, scene 3, line 46 through 57. And we about done, y'all. Oh, yeah. Right on time. Okay. The theme becomes completely clarified in the following passage in which Romeo foresees the strewing of joints and limbs throughout a hungry churchyard. It must be remembered that the Flavian satirical system indicated that the Jewish Messiah was pruned that is, his limbs were taken off and eaten by his followers. In Romeo and Juliet, this grim joke was reversed back upon the Gentiles' royal family. Quote, Romeo, in what I further shall intend to do, by heaven <clears throat> I will tear thee joint by joint and strew this hungry churchyard with thy limbs. End quote. Act 5, scene 3. Line 36, having established the punning theme on joint, the author delivers the punchline at the conclusion of the play. In the following passage, Juliet's father asks for Montague's hand, calling it his daughter's jointure or dowry. Quote, Capulet, O oh, brother Montague, give me your hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. End quote. And that's Act 5, Scene 3, line 296 through 298. The satire of cannibalism in the Shakespearean literature is taken to perhaps the highest metaphorical pitch in Romeo and Juliet. The first fruits in Romeo and Juliet are a punning substance, the flower that is the flower of youth. Okay, so they use the two different flowers. Flower, F. L-O-W-E-R, then it says that is the flower, which is like the food flower, F-L-O-U-R of youth. I read it again. The first fruits in Romeo and Juliet are a punning substance, the flower that is the flower of youth. Juliet and Romeo are incorporated, made into one body and flesh in the marriage service. They shall not stay alone till Holy Church incorporate two into one. Act 2, scene 3, line 37. This metaphorical logic continues with Juliet's father, who is opposed to the marriage, stating, God's bread, it makes me mad. Act 3, scene 5, line 18. The list of flowers, or like the food flower, the list of flowers for the Lammas Tide bread includes... The handsome but weak flower, which is like a plant flower of Romeo. The sweetest flower, Act 4, Scene 5, Line... Hold on. Yeah, Act 4, Scene 5, Line 28. Juliet, now deflowered. Act 4, Scene 5, Line 37. Although she was not really ripe, 
Paris, who is a flower, like the plant flower. Paris, who is a flower, and very faith a flower. At one, scene three, line 78. Mercutio, who is the flower known as pink. At two, scene four, line 60. And I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to read this whole sentence again. Hold on. And has already been peppered. And Juliet's relative, Tybalt, who may belong to a floral family, but is green in the earth. Act 4, scene 3, line 42. Okay, so I'm going to read this again, and I'm going to leave out the acts and the scenes, right? Okay. So let me explain this. Okay, so it's talking about the ingredients or the list of flowers, like flowers to be eaten because they all about to die, right? And they, it's representing cannibalism. Okay, so the flower the flowers or the different types of flowers f-l-o-u-r-s for those that don't have the book that's why i'm explaining it how they got this worded but when it's referring to the people actual or the flower the flower plant flower of romeo is considered juliet right which is the sweetest flower and then juliet now deflower you know she the married romeo they didn't get it on right so she's she's deflowered like y'all get it it's it's playing on the word flowers and the different flowers right okay all right. The list of flowers for the Lammas Tide bread includes the handsome but weak flower of Romeo, the sweetest flower, Juliet now deflowered, although she was not really right, Paris, who is a flower in the very faith, a flower, Mercutio, who is the flower known as pink and has already been peppered, and Juliet's relative Tybalt, who may belong to a floral family, but is green in earth. From the tomb, the various bodies will provide the flower for the feast of Lammastide. The playwright is simply reversing the joint and bread humor in the Gospels that concluded on the Passover with a Gentile version of the story that concludes on their feast day of the consecrated bread. And that, my beautiful people, is our reading for today mom shalom shalom all right y'all so that was all of chapter seven we're getting closer and closer to chapter 15 no 15 or 11 y'all know i'm excited about getting to this revelation chapter chapter 11 we're getting closer and closer okay y'all so tomorrow we'll start chapter eight and chapter eight is about hamlet so it's gonna break down hamlet if you guys haven't seen hamlet <clears throat> go watch Hamlet. I don't care which version you watch or listen to or, or what have you. They got audiobook. It's all listed there. But to keep up so you can understand what's going on so you can now see it with with the proper um the proper understanding of what's going on, how this all plays into the New Testament, the gospels and all the shenanigans that went on. It's good. I'm not you don't have to. I'm not saying that you have to, but I'm just saying it becomes more enjoyable and you kind of keep up and you understand what's going on and you can see the relation between oh snap what you know so i like to have visuals when i'm reading stuff because i'm not i'm really a visual person and if i can do something or show something to that'll help wake you up that's what we're gonna do so that's why i say you know go watch it you know i said watch it in like the the most modern version if you're not used to listening to the older movies and stuff and you know it's like i don't know what they saying but if you see it in color you know and they kind of modernize they still talk in that way but you would get the gist of everything that's going on even if you watch the newer version and you don't look at the old version you will be able to pick up on what's being said and you'll be able to understand it. it makes it a lot more interesting but i'm just saying as we get through here y'all and we we start breaking down revelation is all of this is is, is gonna you're gonna need to have known this right it, you'll be able to participate and understand it's like when you go to class and your teacher or a college class or whatever whatever kind of study they give you if you don't read the syllabus if you don't read the syllabus and look at the references and the extra readings and stuff you're supposed to be reading and your or your teacher or tell your instructor say read the first six chapters of this book we're gonna talk about this tomorrow what six chapters we're gonna talk about this tomorrow like I'll go to bed tonight, wake up tomorrow. Six chapters I'm supposed to read. 
that's why I love audiobooks because you can consume a lot of information and be able to have an intelligent or informed conversation with somebody. So that's what I'm saying, y'all. If you're going to be here and enjoy this, if you get a chance, if you can't watch it, just let it play in your ear or something so you can hear it. Like, you know, I'm just saying. I'm telling you. I don't know if y'all be as excited about this as I am because I'm actually doing what I'm telling y'all to go do. You know, hopefully y'all might listen. We can kind of engage and have some conversation because... You didn't did the reading, right? Okay. All right, y'all. So, into you. That's the end of chapter. End of chapter. I'm sorry. That's the end of chapter seven, y'all. We won't be here tomorrow. It's the Sabbath, right? What page is this? And we are Sabbatani, right? I Meaning we keep the Sabbath. Two or eight. Okay, so we'll be back here Saturday morning, y'all, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today is Thursday, November the 11th, 2021, day 300 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets. Another three-year consecutive day count, day 968. We read Psalms 91 through 94, and we read the rest of chapter 7, Romeo and Juliet, pages 196 to page 207. All right, y'all. Mabella. I'm gonna go ahead and end this without her today, right? I'm just I'm just gonna do it because I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna have to deal with the little lady later. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and do the blessing. Cause I don't feel like hauling up the stairs for. Her. She done came down here, got her little snack, and went back upstairs because she watching Paw Patrol. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave her be, right? She in a good mood. She may not give me too much flack about this this morning, right? I'm just gonna walk through here. Like I'm right and ain't did nothing wrong. <laughs> the blessing is found. <laughs> she's, gonna be, she's gonna be mad if I lay. Go see what your sister doing, Josh. <laughs> Tell her I'm about to end this. Ask her, ask her if she wanna end the video today. <laughs> yeah, Josh looked at me. He started walking on there. Just go go on, go ask her. They know they're like, we don't wanna deal with her loud mouth. How can something so tiny be so loud? She loud, y'all. She loud. I hear her coming. She coming. Hey, girl. I just woke up. <laughs> no. Come on. Come on. Everybody waiting on you. I was gonna try and pull a quick one on you. A fast one. I was about to do the blessing without you. And Tyler said that I'm gonna be mad. Okay. Blessing is found in Numbers chapter six, verses twenty-two through twenty-seven. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with the hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up the wholeness of his being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need. He will set in place all we need. He will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. I love y'all. We're about to get out of here. Mom. All right, y'all. I see y'all Saturday. All right. Hold on. You Hold on. Dad wants some. Ooh. Who, did Dad come get cake? No. Who ate the cake? It was 10 slices. I only see eight. You know who ate the cake? Boys. The boys. Two of the boys. So I'm going to say it was possibly Jeremiah and Jonathan. Because if it was the smaller boys, there would be three pieces missing. So I'm thinking it's the two older boys. Your older brethren and your cousin. Two slices are missing. Because had the younger ones, all three of them would have got a slice. They're going to be like... If I'm gonna get in trouble, all three of us gonna get in trouble together. So everybody, you eat a slice. One eat was a slice, open, and you eat a slice. So we go all keep another quiet. one. <laughs> and if somebody tell, we all get in trouble. That's how they operate. I like how they think. 
I mean, not that they would go do something, but y'all see, right? They they kind of work together, and it's funny. Yeah, that's what. See, one, two, three. Wait, bring that closer so I can see. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. That's right, cause this only has eight. That's how I can tell two a miss, and I knew it was five on each row. Put that back. Yep. Two slices are missing from this, and I know, I know, Dad didn't eat any. I was with Dad all last night. And, we, and I didn't see him too. eating cake. Me too. Mom, someone's <clears> eating and the dad, this one. And the dad come see somebody and opened up his vanilla cake. All right, y'all. We out here. Go ahead and end this. Love y'all. See y'all Saturday, 7.30 a.m. <clears throat> Eastern Standard Time. Yes. Y'all broke my nail. I gotta go get it fixed. Let me see. Let me see. <laughs> I've been doing good, not showing my nail all day, but when I did peace, I was debating what I was.